All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to take the derivative of inverse trig functions. And so in the past, we have looked at how to take the derivative of inverse functions, but we did not look at how to take the derivative of inverse functions for trigonometric functions. And so before we can talk about how to take the derivative of inverse trig functions, we first need to establish what the inverse trig functions are. And so consider the sine function, you'll see that I have its graph right here. And remember that in order to have an inverse function, a function needs to have only one value of x for each value of y. And if it doesn't, then we need to restrict its domain. And so what you're going to find for the trig functions is that every trig function has an inverse relationship, but they only have an inverse if their domain is restricted. And so if we look at the graph of the sine function here, is it true that there is only one value of x for each value of y? And we can see very quickly that that is not true, right? We can see that when x is equal to zero, y is also equal to zero, right, at the origin here. And when x is equal to pi, y is equal to zero. And when x is equal to negative pi, y is also equal to zero. And so this could continue on forever, right? I don't have the entire sine function graphed here, but this would continue to oscillate around the x-axis and we would continue to have more x values where the y value is zero. And so the sine function, like all of the other trig functions, are not going to have one value of x for each value of y. There are going to be multiple values of x that have the same value of y. And so what we have to do in order to have an inverse function for sine and the other trig functions is restrict their domain. And so the restriction is going to be different for each trig function, and we'll look at that in a second. But for the sine function, we would restrict its domain to be from x equals negative pi over two, from this point right here, to positive pi over two, this point right here. And so you'll notice that for the sine function from this point to this point, each value of x corresponds to one value of y, right? The moment that we pass this point on this side or pass this point over onto this side, we would have a point that shares a y value with one of the points on the other side of that point. And that would be true up here as well. All the points on this side of this point would share y values with points over here. And so hopefully you can see that. Hopefully it makes sense why we need to restrict the domain of the sine function and our other trig functions so that they have inverses. And so then if we were to graph the inverse of the sine function, it would look a little something like this. Now that's not a perfect representation of the inverse sine function, but it gives you an idea of what it would look like. It does not continue on forever, but it does have the reversed coordinate points of the sine function from negative pi over two to pi over two. Okay, and so the inverse of the sine function, right, f inverse of x would be equal to sine inverse of x. Now, this is the notation you will sometimes see for the inverse of the sine function. However, it is more common to write it like this. We'll have arc sine of x, and that means the same thing as this notation, right? Arc sine of x is the inverse function of the sine function. And so the reason that we use this notation more commonly is that it's less likely to confuse you of what the function is, right? Some students get confused with this notation because they think it's the sine function to the negative first power, when in reality, that negative one is just a superscript. It is not the sine function to the negative first power. And so to avoid that confusion, we use this notation for the inverse of the sine function, as well as the inverse for our other trigonometric functions. And so speaking of which, let's look at those other inverse functions for our trig functions. There are six in total. We have arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, arc cotangent, arc secant, and arc cosecant. And then we have their respective domains and ranges that result from restricting the domain of the original function that the inverses come from. Okay, and so if you wanna pause the video and look over the domain and the ranges of each of these functions, feel free to do so. But now that we've established what the inverse trig functions are, we want to look at how to take the derivative of these functions. All right, so here we have f of x equals sine of x, and we have the inverse function, which is arc sine of x, and we wanna know the derivative of that inverse function, right? What is the derivative of arc sine of x, the inverse of the sine function? And so if you recall from a previous lesson where we looked at the derivative of inverse functions, we had a formula that we could use to find the derivative of inverse functions. And the formula says that the derivative of an inverse function is equal to one divided by f prime of the inverse function. And so what this means is we are plugging the inverse function 
into the derivative of the original function. And so in order to use this formula, we are going to need to take the derivative of our original function here, sine x. And that's fairly simple. We know that the derivative f prime of x for sine x is just cosine x. And so then if we use this formula here, we will have that the derivative d dx of our inverse function, which I'm gonna write as arc sine of x, we'll have arc sine x is equal to one divided by cosine of arc sine of x. Okay, and so we could certainly say that this is the derivative of the arc sine function, but we can actually rewrite this to look a little bit different by using one of our trig identities. Specifically, we're gonna be looking at the trig identity that sine squared x plus cosine squared x is equal to one. And so what we can do here is solve for cosine x, and we're going to use whatever that is equal to to replace this cosine in this function right here, right? And so let me show you what I mean. Let's solve for cosine here. We'll subtract sine squared x from both sides, and so we'll have that cosine squared x is equal to one minus sine squared x. And then if we wanna solve for cosine x, remember that cosine squared x is the same as the cosine function squared. And so if we take the square root of both sides of this equation, we will have that cosine x is equal to the square root of one minus sine squared x. Okay, and so what we can do with this result is replace cosine of arc sine of x with this function where x, right, whatever is plugged into our cosine function, is the arc sine function, and something really cool is going to happen here. And so watch what happens. This will be equal to one divided by the square root of one minus sine squared x, or in this case, arc sine x, and now that is going to lead to an interesting result. And so what I'm going to do here is rewrite this sine squared as this whole quantity squared, right? That would be the same thing. And so I'm gonna erase this, and we're just going to write sine and then have the whole quantity squared. And so then what happens here is that we have sine of arc sine of x. And remember, arc sine is the inverse function of sine. And when you have an inverse function plugged into the original function, they undo each other and leave you with x. And so this is equal to one divided by the square root of one minus that leftover x squared, right? This square doesn't go anywhere. It's still squaring this quantity, but sine and arc sine cancel out because they're inverse functions. And this x is what is left over. And so we have x squared. And so I can get rid of those parentheses and we'll just have x squared. And now we have the derivative of the arc sine function. It's just one divided by the square root of one minus x squared. And so if I clean up my work a little bit here, we can also have another form of this derivative where you have arc sine of some function other than x, right? In a scenario where you would need to use the chain rule. We would have that the derivative with respect to x of arc sine of some function u that is defined with x would be equal to one divided by the square root of one minus u squared times the derivative of u du dx, right? That would be the application of the chain rule for this derivative rule. And we could rewrite du dx to just be u prime and then multiply it through the numerator. And so we would have that u prime divided by the square root of one minus u squared is the derivative of arc sine of u. Okay, and so we could go through the same process for all of the other inverse trig functions and find their corresponding derivative rules. However, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through the derivation of each of the derivative rules. We're just going to look at them as a whole now, and then we'll look at an example of using each of those rules. All right, so here's our derivative rules for all of the inverse trig functions. You'll notice that they kind of come in pairs in terms of their similarities. For example, the derivative of arc sine, which we just found, is u prime divided by the square root of one minus u squared. But notice that the derivative of arc cosine of u is the same derivative, but negated, right? It's the same derivative as arc sine of u, but it's the negative version of that derivative. And then we have the derivative of arc tangent of u that is equal to u prime divided by one plus u squared. And the derivative of arc cotangent of u is the same as that derivative, but negated, right? We have negative u prime divided by one plus u squared. 
And it's also true for this pair down here with secant and cosecant, the derivative of arc secant of u is equal to u prime divided by the absolute value of u times the square root of u squared minus one. And the derivative of arc cosecant u is that same derivative, but negated. Okay, and so when you're trying to learn these derivative rules, try to learn them in those pairs of arc sine and arc cosine, arc tangent and arc cotangent, and arc secant and arc cosecant, right? You only really need to remember three derivatives, but you just need to remember what their partner function is so that you can negate that derivative for those functions, okay? So try to learn them in pairs if you can. It's going to make it a lot easier for you to remember these derivative rules. And so now that we know all of these rules for the derivative of inverse trig functions, let's look at some examples where we use these rules. Okay, so first up we have the derivative of three times arc sine of x. And so if we're going to take the derivative of this function, we need to know the derivative rule for arc sine, which we have right here. And so if we use that rule, this will be equal to that constant multiple three times the derivative of the arc sine function. And so in this case, u is just equal to x and the derivative of x or u prime would just be one, right? The derivative of x is one. And so we'll be multiplying by one divided by the square root of one minus u squared. And remember, u is equal to x, and so we will have x squared. And so if we simplify, this is equal to three divided by the square root of one minus x squared. And that is the derivative of this function. Next, we have the derivative of arc cosine of three x. And so here we have the derivative rule for the arc cosine function. Remember, it's the same derivative as the arc sine function, except it's negative. And so if we use that for this function, u is going to be equal to three x. And so we'll start by having that this is equal to negative u prime. And so that's going to be the derivative of three x, but then with a negative in front. And so the derivative of three x is just three, right? The derivative of x to the first power is just equal to its coefficient. And so in this case, that's just three. And so the derivative is three, but you need to remember that it's going to be negative for the derivative of arc cosine. And so we'll put a negative out front, and then that's divided by the square root of one minus u squared. And in this case, u is three x, and so we will have three x squared. All right, and so then we can simplify this by squaring three x and we'll have that this is equal to negative three divided by the square root of one minus three squared, which is nine times x squared, which is x squared, okay? And so that is the derivative of this function. Next, we have the derivative of arctangent of x cubed plus one. And so here we have our derivative rule for arctangent of u, and that's going to be u prime divided by one plus u squared. And so in this case, u is equal to x cubed plus one. And so the first thing we wanna do is find u prime. And so that's going to be the derivative of x cubed plus one. And so this will be equal to that derivative in the numerator here. So the derivative of x cubed using the power rule is going to be three x squared, right? We multiply the three down and subtract one from the exponent. So we have three times x squared and the derivative of one is zero because one is a constant. And so three x squared is u prime, that is the derivative of our inside function u, and we're dividing by one plus u squared. And so u is x cubed plus one, and so we will have x cubed plus one squared. And then that's it, there's no simplifying that we really need to do here, and so this is the final answer for this derivative. Next we have the derivative of arc cotangent of e to the power of x, and then we have our derivative rule here for arc cotangent, but remember that is the same thing as the derivative of arc tangent, except it is negative. And so in this case, u is equal to e to the power of x, and so we'll start by finding the derivative of e to the power of x, right, that would be u prime, and so this will be equal to the derivative of e to the power of x, which is just e to the power of x, right, the derivative of e to the x is itself, and remember to make that negative so that you follow this derivative rule, and so we will have negative e to the power of x divided by one plus u squared. And remember, u is e to the power of x, and so we will have e to the power of x squared. And so if we simplify, we'll have that this is equal to negative e to the power of x divided by one plus 
e to the power of x squared. And remember, when you have a value with an exponent and that is raised to a power, you multiply those exponents together. And so two times x is two x. And so e to the power of x squared is e to the power of two x. And so this is the derivative of this function. Next, we have the derivative of arc secant of x squared. And here is the derivative rule for arc secant of u. In this case, u is going to be equal to x squared. And so if we follow this derivative rule, we will have that this is equal to the derivative of u, u prime. And so the derivative of x squared is 2x, right? That's using the power rule. We multiply the exponent down and then subtract one from the exponent. And so we have 2 times x to the first power. And that will be divided by the absolute value of u, which is x squared. And so we'll have x squared in those absolute value bars times the square root of u squared minus one. And so u is still x squared. And so we will have x squared squared minus one, right? x squared is u. And so we need to square that, which is why we have x squared squared. Okay, and so when we simplify this, Notice that x squared is always going to be a positive value, right? Because when you square a negative value, it becomes positive. And so these absolute value bars are not going to be necessary. So if we simplify, we'll have that this is equal to 2x divided by x squared times the square root of x squared squared. And so if we multiply those exponents, we will have x to the fourth power minus one. And then there's one more thing we can do here. Notice that we have an x in the numerator here that can be canceled out with one of these x's in the denominator. And so this x will cancel out with one of these. And our final answer is that the derivative is equal to two divided by x times the square root of x to the fourth power minus one. And that is the derivative of this arc secant function. Finally, we have the derivative of arc cosecant of the natural log of x. And here we have our derivative rule for the arc cosecant function. And remember that this derivative is the same as the arc secant function's derivative, except it is negative. And so in this case, u is the natural log of x. And so to start, we are going to be taking the derivative of u or u prime. And so the derivative of the natural log function is just one divided by x, right? Remember that the derivative d dx of the natural log of x is equal to one divided by x. And so we'll start by having that this is equal to one divided by x. And then remember that it needs to be negative for the arc cosecant function. So this is a negative and that will be divided by the absolute value of u. And so we're going to have the absolute value of the natural log function and then times the square root of u squared, which is going to be the natural log function squared and then minus one. And so we'll have minus one. All right, and so then if we wanna simplify this, note that we could rewrite this expression as this numerator times one divided by this denominator, right? And so we'd have that this is equal to negative one divided by x times one divided by the absolute value of the natural log of x times the square root of the natural log of x squared minus one, right? We can rewrite this to be this and then multiply this x into the denominator and we'll have that this is equal to negative one divided by the absolute value of the natural log of x times x times the square root of the natural log function squared minus one. And that will be our final answer for the derivative of this arc cosecant function. Okay, and so with that, that is all I had for this lesson. If you wanna see some more examples, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.